Hello, and welcome to Bridge Online. My name's Paul. And I'm Bethany, and we're so glad that you're here today. We would love to know where you're tuning in from right now, so why don't you let us know in the chat? And if this is your first time joining us, or you've been with us for a while, we're so glad that you're tuning in. The Bridge is, is a church that exists to be with Jesus and become like Him for the sake of the world, and that's exactly what we're gonna do today. So as we dive into a time in God's Word together, we pray that this blesses you and that it allows all of us to abide with and be transformed by Jesus both today and every day. And if it's your first time tuning in, we are so excited that you're here. If you could do just one thing, drop a waving emoji in the chat right now. One of our online hosts would love to reach out and say hi. And if this isn't your first time, will you help me welcome everyone with a big bridge welcome? We know that we do this together. So after you do that, go ahead and share the stream with a family member or friends. You never know who might need to hear today's message. So as we enter into a time of worship, I wanna take a moment to encourage you wherever you find yourself right now, whether that's your bedroom, your dorm room, your living room, or your office, take a moment to allow this to be a sanctuary where you can be with Jesus. Set aside any distractions, get a copy of God's Word ready, maybe grab a notebook and a pen so that you can take notes as you follow along. Yeah. Remember, we're not doing this alone. So at any point, if something encourages you, you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat so we can do this journey together. And on that note, let's dive into God's Word together.
get to heaven, then I'm gonna see how it came together for your glory.
church, as we continue to worship, let us sing and proclaim this truth that we have trust in Jesus because he is faithful. He is forever true. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus,
Jesus, thank you for the truth and the power that's found within that word. Thank you for being our shalom. Church, shalom means peace. It means restoration. And there is coming a day where the one who defeated sin and death will return and he will restore all things, amen? All things, every tear will be wiped from our eye. Everything that's sick will be healed in the name of Jesus. Everything will be restored because his kingdom is coming. His kingdom is coming and all we get to do is usher it in. Who's ready for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven, amen? What hope we have to look forward to, church, what hope. Church, it is so good to worship together today and to get to proclaim these truths of God. Hey, whether you've been here for 20 years or this is your first Sunday in church, I just want you to know how happy we are that you're here today. Why don't we just make this feel like a family? Turn to your left and to your right. Give someone a fist bump or a high five. Tell them good evening. Then you can grab a seat. chance to meet before. My name is Hannah, and I'm a part of our team here at The Bridge. And hey, if you would consider yourself new around here, I just want to say welcome. I hope you're already feeling a part of our family, and I want to let you know about an environment that is created specifically with you in mind. It's what we call Open House. Open House is the best place for you to learn all about our mission, our vision, and our values. And in fact, it just happened this past service at our four o'clock. But don't worry, it happens on the first Sunday of the month. And so we want to invite you to come and join us for Open House on the first Sunday of May. It'll happen during our four o'clock service, and we would love to see you there. And for all of us, we can stay connected all throughout the week through our Connect card at bridge.tv slash next. There you can indicate any next steps you might feel led to take, any prayer requests you might have, or maybe even a question you might have. And we would love to come alongside you in that. You can also fill out a physical Connect card by reaching in that seat back in front of you. Well, y'all, last Sunday was a big Sunday in Bridge history as we gathered with over 6,000 people over our Easter weekend. Isn't that incredible? We had many people indicate that they wanted to follow Jesus for the very first time. We had people who said that they just had questions about what it might look like to follow Jesus. And we had 34 people indicate that they wanted to take the step in publicly declaring their faith through baptism. Yes, we can celebrate that. We celebrate that not because of the numbers, but first and foremost, to give glory to God for drawing people near to himself and allowing us to be a part. And we also celebrate that because we get to come alongside our brothers and sisters as they declare that they have been brought from death to life. And so we'll continue to celebrate on April 28th for our baptism Sunday. And y'all, I'm a little bit biased, but it's some of my favorite Sundays here at the bridge as we get to cheer with all of the angels and saints in heaven over people's salvation. So I hope that you'll come and join us for baptism Sunday on April 28th. And as I'm talking about this, if you feel like God might be nudging you to join and take that step in baptism as well, you can go to bridge.tv slash baptism and read more about what that looks like and sign up there. And we would love to come alongside you in that too. 
Well, y'all, every time we gather, we always take a moment to worship God through our generosity. And so if you call the bridge your home, you'll see ways that you can give on the screen or in just a moment, the buckets will be passed and you can place your gifts in there as well. And as the ushers come forward, let's turn towards the screen to check out our new series, Every Table. Sixty years ago, the average dinner time was 90 minutes. Today, it's less than 12. We're losing the table. 77% of Americans feel our country is more divided than ever before. We are losing the table. Three in five adults say they are deeply alone. We are losing the table. Maybe that's why Jesus cared about it so much. Moments before his arrest, Jesus isn't giving one more sermon or performing one more miracle. He's sharing a meal at a table. In fact, it's hard to find any gathering in the New Testament that didn't occur at a table. At the table, foes turned into friends, strangers turned into family, and the lost became found. So what if we reclaimed the table? What if our tables weren't just for feeding, but for forming? weren't for isolation, but for impact. Weren't for retreating, but for reaching. The change we long to see isn't found in sound bites, quick fixes, or online debates. The healing we long for in our families, neighborhoods, and communities isn't found behind a screen, but at a table. At the table, lost people get found. Found people grow. Lonely people find family. Hurting people find healing. Bored people find purpose. Neighborhoods find hope. The kingdom comes from heaven to earth. So what if, before we sat at any table, anywhere, with anyone, we prayed at this table as it is in heaven? brought the gospel back to the table. What if we brought the gospel back to every table? Well, good. Yeah, all right. Absolutely. Good evening, 5 p.m. How are you feeling tonight? You guys good? I'm so glad you're here. I, uh, I didn't tell him I was going to do this, but that sweet, sultry voice was none other than Tim Harris, who's right over here. Can we give it up for Tim? We love you, man. I'm so grateful for you. Uh, before we go any further, by the way, we know a bunch of people are joining us online and in Murray and Perry County Jail. Can, can we make an obnoxious amount of noise in welcoming them, please? We love you guys so much. As we uh, start a new series today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. If you want to turn or swipe there, you can. And as we do every week, we begin first with a, a simple prayer posture, both uh, a posture of letting go and a posture of receiving. And I say it all the time. I don't know what you need to let go of, and I have no idea what you need to receive, um, but God does. So if you're comfortable, I'd love to invite you to this. I'll pray, and then we'll jump right in. 
God, what, what a gift it is to be together at all, to sing and to learn and celebrate God as we join millions of brothers and sisters around the globe today. God, would you remind us that you are the senior pastor of this and every church? God, would you give us ears to hear and hearts to understand and the courage to live differently? Holy Spirit, would you do a work in us and through us that only you can do? Help us to let go of what we need to let go of and to receive what it is you have for us to receive. We thank you, God, and we love you. And we pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. I, want to, uh, I want to tell you a story about a guy named Harry Winston. Uh, in the 1950s, he became really famous. In fact, he had a nickname called the King of Jewelry, which is a, a baller nickname, we can agree, right? And uh, he got that nickname for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was because of his diamond collection. And in 1958, Harry actually donated what is called the Hope Diamond to the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, the Hope Diamond is worth $300 million and is 45.5 carats, just slightly bigger than the ring I proposed to my wife with, <laughs> like a little bit. And I think we can all agree, uh, even owning a diamond like that is wild, right? But that's not even the most wild part of the story. In fact, uh, do you want to know how Harry sent the Hope Diamond from New York City to Washington, D.C.? Dropped it in an envelope. <laughs> right? Isn't that wild? Like, y'all, I don't feel comfortable sending gift cards through the mail. Like, do you understand? Can you imagine taking an envelope, placing the Hope Diamond in it, slapping some stamps on it, giving it to the mail carrier and saying, to D.C., please? Like, that's wild to me. In fact, they, they actually interviewed the mail carrier, and uh, they asked him what he thought of the whole experience, and his response was, and I quote, I just didn't want to lose it. <laughs> Which I imagine is how most of us would feel, right? But later in the interview, though, it was actually a really tender moment. He reflected on his experience and talked about the privilege and the weight of carrying something that valuable. When it comes to the mission that Jesus has given us as Christ followers, we have been entrusted with something that I think is far more valuable than any diamond ever could be. And the question I would love for us to sit with for a little bit is, do we feel the weight of that? The weight and the value of what has been entrusted to us by Jesus. As we embark on this journey for the next five weeks or so, uh, we thought it would be smart to start in the book of Acts. The account of like how the early church lived as the early church. What did they do? What did they see? What did they experience? What did it actually mean in this first century context? We want to learn from them and how God wants to move today in our everyday lives. Now, uh, some of you will know this, Acts is sort of like part two of Luke's gospel. We spent a lot of time in Luke's gospel this year so far in Acts. Uh, your Bible maybe has it called the Acts of the Apostle. It's sort of the part two, and it's, it's anchored specifically on Jesus. Not an idea or a construct or philosophy, but an impossible reality. Flesh and blood on the other side of death having breakfast on the beach. That's where Acts begins. So Acts chapter 1 verse 1 says this, uh, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus begun to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now the word Theophilus here means friend of God, and in Luke chapter 1, he actually refers to him as most excellent Theophilus, which was a phrase reserved for like Roman governors. So it's likely that Theophilus was a, a man of some kind of stature. But Luke, though, was, was a physician, and that's worth noting because he writes like a physician. He researches like a physician. He captures data like a physician. He was also a traveling companion uh, with Paul for part of Acts. But in the book of Acts, we see 80 different geographical locations out outlined. A hundred different people are mentioned by name. There are 24 speeches recorded over the span of 30 years. Luke is recording with precision what these first years of the church were like. And I think they, they offer a lot of wisdom for us today. So Acts goes on, verse 3. After his suffering, meaning Jesus, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't know this before preparing for this, but this word for proofs here in the Greek, this is the only use of that specific word in the New Testament. So I did a little digging. I thought it was interesting. 
Because the word proofs here is not just evidence. That's kind of where my mind goes. Like, oh, we gathered uh, sufficient data, and now we have uh, this proof. This specific word speaks to the kind of evidence that only comes through either touch or sight. That's the word that Luke the physician uses here. The kind of proofs that only come through touch or sight, not just totaling together and coming to a conclusion. And so as we dive into the rest of the book of Acts, not just for today, but for the rest of the series, I want to challenge you to like try as best you can to put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. You've had maybe the most frenetic week of your life if you're a disciple, right? You've seen your friend and rabbi crucified and buried, and then there's rumors that he's no longer in the tomb, but you can't maybe bring yourself to believe it. And then you're having breakfast with him on the beach. I imagine it's a bit of a whirlwind. You're still having maybe a hard time making sense of it all. And then here's what happens in verse 4. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, which, (laughs) again, by the way, I love that Luke records stuff like this. We mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is either at a meal, going to a meal, leaving a meal, or preparing a meal. If you read the Gospel of Luke and you don't get hungry, you're not reading it right. So again, here in sort of part two of Luke's Gospel, we have Jesus again eating. Jesus loves the table. He loves meals, like sharing meals with other flesh and blood people, not just simply proclaiming messages on a mountain somewhere. So it says he was eating with them, and then he gave, him, gave them this command. He says, do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now confession, and I'm not, I don't love this part of me, but like if I saw my friend raised from the dead, um, waiting would not be the thing I'd be looking to do. Are you tracking? Like if Jesus had been claiming these things and you're like, we're not quite sure if you could believe it or not, and then he's there in front of you, how many of you are like, oh, we should probably just wait a little bit? I'd be like, let's go, right? You're here. Let's, come, let's go change the world. Like I, this, this invitation to wait is such an interesting one, and we'll unpack in a second why that is. But I think it's interesting, though, because in Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, he tells them to go, right? Go and make all disciples. He says, all authority is mine. Go and make disciples, not spectators, not even converts, by the way, disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he ends with the promise, I'm with you always. You don't have anything to fear. But here he says you need to wait. They need to wait for the gift the Father promised. He's saying to what I imagine is a very uh, eager group of disciples. He's like, listen, you're going to go change the world. You're going to go get them. But first you need to wait. Because if you go out there in your own strength, with your own ingenuity, with your own philosophy and structures and strategies, it's going to fall flat on its face. You need to wait for the gift the Father will send. And we'll find out in a second what that is. And then he talks about baptism. And I just love this, this picture, this idea of like elevating uh, baptism to not just a physical but spiritual act here. In a couple of weeks, we will celebrate baptism here. And we say that when someone goes under the water, they're being identified with Christ in his death and his burial. They come up out of the water uniting with him in his resurrection. And no one who has ever been baptized at the bridge would go home and say, I got like a little bit wet today. (laughs) It's like a fully immersive by design experience. And that's some of what I think Jesus is getting after here. Like be so immersed in the spirit, be drenched in the spirit. That, That is what's coming after you wait. And I think this is so important and I've said it here before, but the Christian life, apart from the Holy Spirit, is not difficult. It's impossible. Attempting to live the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit inevitably always leads to moralism. We're filled with pride when we do really, really well, and we're filled with despondency when we don't hit the mark. The Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit isn't just tough. It's not just difficult. It's impossible. Verse 6 goes on. It says, They gathered around him, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. This, this is, again, a really human part of the disciples, and I love that it's included, because we see this throughout the Gospels. They, they still have in mind that Jesus is like a military leader, and he's going to establish, he's going he's to bring Israel back to its prior glory. And so they're seeing the resurrected Jesus, and they're like, Surely now... Jesus. Now is the time you're going to establish like in an earthly sense. And what Jesus doesn't do 
he doesn't even really rebuke their question. He says, it's not for you to know. That's like an ancient way of like, don't worry about it. Which, by the way, have you ever had someone tell you, don't worry about it, and it actually led to you not worrying about it? <laughs> Does anyone else that has the opposite effect? You're like, don't worry about it. Like, well, now I'm worried about it. He's like, don't, listen, it's not for you to know. And then in response, Jesus gives them what, what will be his last words to them. So again, imagine you're a disciple. And we have the benefit of history, but imagine that these are the last words that Jesus speaks to you, his disciples, his apprentices. Here's what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I would argue this essentially is the outline for the whole book. If you want to know what Acts is about, Acts 1-8 is a good place to start. You will receive power, and you're going to be my witnesses, not just here, but to the very ends of the earth. In other words, he tells them, you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to change the whole globe. He's saying, listen, the gospel can't go forward if I remain with you physically on earth. As long as Jesus remained with them, he would be the primary preacher. He'd be the geographical focus. We see this again and again and again with Jesus. He's looking to give away power and influence, to delegate, say, you now go do this. You are sent people. There is no such thing as a non-sent Christian. i got to try really hard to not say nonsense Christian. The first century church knows no such version of spectator Christianity. There was no category. He's saying, you're going to receive power to go then do what I have been teaching you to do. You'll be filled with the Spirit of God, and I won't just simply be with you. God will be in you, and he calls them to be witnesses. Now, I don't know what your experience with the word witness is. Mine was riddled. (laughs) Like, I think of, like, someone being like, can I get a witness? And you all say, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) This is the kind of 5 p.m. energy I'm here for. This is, yeah, someone's, yeah, maybe the word witness for you, like, means, I don't know, like like a style of music or a style of preaching or an evangelistic act. But a witness in the biblical sense is a representative sent on mission. A witness is not just simply like a passive recipient of information, but someone sent on mission, which I think is worth stating then. We are called to be witnesses, and there's a reason that you cannot be a witness and a prosecuting attorney at the same time. And some Christ followers have taken upon themselves to be everyone else's prosecuting attorney pointing out the faults in everyone else's life and the way that they're living or not living. And I, I, I think it's worthy of our attention that Jesus doesn't say, now go and be my attorney. Go and be my prosecutor. What does he say? Be my witness. Bear witness to the work that I have done in you, which doesn't mean that you have to have like all your theological ducks in a row. It's essentially saying, man, I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know that I can answer every one of your questions. Can I bear witness, though, to what he's done in my life or in my marriage or with my parenting or with my, with my life? And I imagine maybe at this point his disciples were okay with, like, okay, the Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. These were, like, regions they were familiar with. But I wonder if it raised some eyebrows when he said, into the ends of the earth. Because keep in mind, there's only about 120 of them at this point. And their understanding, I imagine, of the globe was rightfully massive. So we say, hey, and to the very ends of the earth, and I wonder if they like look behind them and they're like, with, with just these guys? Just, is there another team that I'm not, <laughs> I'm not aware of? Which I think communicates something really, really profound. This is not just simply something that we are meant to do individually, but to always then be raising up others, to be reproducing. And who are we apprenticing? Who are we discipling? Who are we mentoring? Who is coming alongside us? It's not just me and buddy Jesus, but who are we bringing with us as we live as sent people? It's the same thing for us. But I also want us to hone in a little bit further on the word witness here. I love the way that uh, songwriter Savannah Locke talks about it. She wrote a couple of paragraphs. I just want to read it for you because it, it, to me, paints such a beautiful picture that is so different than I think the version I was handed as a kid. She says, growing up, I thought witnessing was going to the mall and handing out religious tracts to strangers in hopes that they would come to church. Anyone done that before? That was my youth group activity, where you'd have the clipboard and you'd walk up to strangers and go, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? Which, shockingly, does not go that well most of the time. I had a lady growl at me once. It's, it's like traumatized me. I can understand that. 
But Jesus' word seems to present a different invitation, an invitation to bear witness to the activity of God in our world. Just like a professor uses a laser pointer to direct her class's attention to something important, our witness acts as a laser pointer to the presence of God. There is God. That's God too. That's what love is. That's goodness. That's gospel. That is life and freedom and healing. To bear witness then is to pay attention. It is to slow down and to be present to the presence of God. It's to notice the whispers, the blooms, the first signs of fall. It is to listen intently without a phone in your hand. It is to resist the rushing hustle and bustle and savor the moment. It is to pray, to chew slowly, to make eye contact. It is to see, savor, and collaborate with God's activity in the world, and it is no small task. And I think there is maybe no better place that that happens than at the table. When we are actually looking at other humans in the eyes, sharing food or coffee or even just that moment and praying, Lord, at this table, as it is in heaven, help me bring the kingdom of God to this conversation, to this moment. Being a witness is pointing to God's presence and activity in our ordinary, everyday lives, everywhere we go, seeing ourselves as sent people, as everyday missionaries. Now, a couple years ago, we did a, uh, an offsite with our lead team, and we had an outside consultant and coach come with us, and there was an exercise that he was walking us through, and part of the exercise was to distill down what we believed God was kind of like leading us towards to two words, and the first word had to be an I-N-G word, and we broke up into different teams. It was a whole kind of elaborate thing, but what was so interesting is we all came with the same two words, that it was bringing presence, and there was this really interesting kind of like unity and alignment around like bringing presence and we left the, those two days we're like yeah something about presence and so I went to our elders and I was like man I'm really excited uh, there's this unity around like bringing presence uh, and our elders went great w- what does that mean and I was like I have no idea I don't know I'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> and so that began about a two-year process of praying and fasting and discerning and discussing and arguing and like trying to discern, right, Lord, where, where are you leading us for this next season of the bridge? And uh, I had a buddy of mine come on our staff retreat last year, and he talked about, he said, kingdom work is like archaeology. He says, you all know, you're never bringing God anywhere. God's already at work in the world. The role of the Christ follower is to unearth where it is that he's at work is to clear away the dirt and say, Lord, what are you doing in this conversation with this coworker, with this family member, with this next door neighbor that I keep avoiding or that person that wronged me six years ago that I, I dodged their calls? Like what, how do we unearth? God, like give us eyes to see where you're at work right here and now. And that's where the table comes in. So after two years, and y'all, I'm telling you, there's a couple elders in the room and they can call me out on this if this isn't true. I, I don't, I don't know that I have ever experienced this kind of unity and alignment with leadership in my life. It's, it really is. It's something really, really special. And so when we talk about, like, what is, the, what is the trajectory of the bridge? Where is God leading us towards? We distilled it down to one simple sentence, bringing the gospel to every table. And the whole point of that is that my guess is all of us have a table, and that's by design. This mission, this vision is not just for the elite or people with musical ability or someone on a stage. We all have tables in our lives. Our hope and prayer is for all of us to see ourselves in that. How, how can I bring the gospel to the tables that I'm at, that I'm around, bringing the gospel to every table? We want this to be something that we all see ourselves in. I love the way that Leonard Sweet put it. He says, if we were to make the table the most sacred object of furniture in every home, in every church, in every community, our faith would quickly regain its power and our world would quickly become a better place. I said it before, you are our strategy. Our strategy is not my sermons, thank God. It's not our music or our website or our buildings, as good as all of those things are. Our strategy is you, is us living on mission. The table is our tool and the gospel is our goal. What if we all actually caught this and saw ourselves as sent people wherever we live, work, and play. The late Dr. William Lane said, when God gives a gift, he wraps it in a person. My, my guess is we all know that to be true. 
Jesus' is, I would argue, main change-making tool was the table. What if we actually took that seriously? The real power is in a church that sees themselves rightly as everyday missionaries. This is the Ephesians 4, man. My, the role of the leadership in the church is not to do the work of ministry, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Amen. If you were at the church and paid staff are doing all the work, we, we have missed the mark. The job of church leadership is to equip the saints. And who are the saints? You are. Woo! You're the saints. So how do we equip the saints to live on mission wherever we live, work, and play? In the first century, everyone saw themselves as a saint, as a priest, to move from spectator to participant to disciple to missionary. Gatherings then became focused on equipping. Put another way, Sundays are the push, not the point. I love what we do on Sundays, by the way. I love being with you all. This is not the point. It's to live on mission the other six days of the week. What if we begin to see the gathering then as like an overflow of what God was doing on, on Tuesday? What, what, if, what if baptisms didn't just simply happen at our address, but they're happening in bathtubs and rivers and ponds and community pools because we're all actually bringing the gospel to whatever tables we're at? And it doesn't just simply happen at one address, but everywhere that we live, this is seeing all of life as living on mission. Mission, then, isn't something we add to our life. It is our life. And so as we know, vision requires provision. And so he here's where this comes in. So a year ago, uh, I walked us through a survey in services. You all remember that? It was like the most uncomfortable I've ever been on this stage, remember? <laughs> I literally just walked us through a survey. It's not necessarily my strength. But we wanted to hear from you. We, we did not want to simply, like, we're going to go up on a mountain and decide on something, and then we're going to come back down, we're just going to tell you. We wanted to actually hear, like, where do you sense God stirring? Where do you sense him leading? Like, what, what would that sound like? And you all pretty much told us three things. One to finish building out under roof here in Spring Hill. There's a bunch of space here that isn't built out, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk a whole lot more about that in the coming weeks. The second was to get a permanent location in Columbia for our Columbia campus as a way of driving a stake in the ground, saying, man, we are here, we are present in this city. And the third, um, a few of you have told me that on occasion we have some traffic issues here. <laughs> some of you are still in Easter traffic, and you just came back for today. Welcome. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. <laughs> And so those are the three things that we're going after. And when I got all sorts of like renderings and pictures and things I'm going to show you in the coming weeks. But those, those are the three things that we're going after. Based on your feedback from a year ago, we believe that our capacity as a church over the next three years above and beyond our regular giving is somewhere to the tune of $5.8 million. And, and that is what we're believing God for. To finish the build out under roof here, to establish a permanent location in Columbia, and to fix our entrance egress issues. What I'd love for you to do then is to mark your calendar for May 5th. That's going to be our commitment Sunday. And I'd love for you all to begin praying now, like, Lord, how would you have me and my family participate in what it is that God is doing here? And I'd love for you to see it through the lens of tables and training. Tables is obvious. We all have tables. I mean, how can I bring the gospel to every table? How do we actually expand spaces here in a permanent space in Columbia to be another table in that city where six, seven days a week there's an opportunity to do the kinds of work and ministry that Jesus did, but also training. How do we actually equip our church to live this out, to provide spaces where we can gather around tables to train one another in living on mission, in living as sent people? The truth is this isn't just a series, and it's, it's honestly not even just an initiative. It's a shift in our trajectory. You're our strategy. The table is our tool, and the gospel is our goal. Here's what, here's what I mean by that. If, if, someone, if someone gives to this initiative, but there's still a terrible tipper on Sundays when they go out to eat, that would not be a win for us. If someone attends faithfully every Sunday of this series, but they still refuse to get to know their next-door neighbor, that would not be a win for us. It's not just about an initiative. It's about seeing our life as mission. Put another way, how can we expect others to believe that a God they can't see loves them when a church they can see doesn't seem to even like them? It's, it's bigger than just the next five weeks. It's even bigger than the next three years. It's about a shift in our trajectory, a shift in how we see what we've been entrusted with. Do we understand the weight of what's been entrusted to us? If you want to know more, 
If you want to look ahead, you can go to bridge.tv slash every table. There's a bunch of resources there that you can peruse. But I'd love for us to begin praying specifically about May 5th and how God would have us participate as we, as we look to bring the gospel to every table. Back to Acts 1, though, for a second. So imagine you're a disciple. You've just been given this charge from Jesus. And then here's what happens in verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Jesus gives this unbelievable charge, and then it's just like, peace out, home slice. And then he's, right? Without warning, probably not peace out, home slice. But he ascends into heaven, right? And the disciples do what maybe a lot of us would do. Verse 10, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. That's what I would be doing, right? Right? I mean, full confession, I'll follow a helium balloon till my eyes burn. Like, I, I can't imagine if I saw Jesus ascend into heaven. So they're staring up into heaven, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. It's sort of like they're saying, like, what are you doing looking at the sky, man? Didn't he give you a job to do? And i got to be honest, I can really relate to that temptation. Sometimes I can be caught gazing at heaven, forgetting that I've been called to bring heaven to earth. So often I can get caught, like, looking to where I saw Jesus last, instead of praying, God, help me to see where you're leading me next. These two men say, what are you doing looking up there? No, no, no. You've been given a charge. You've been given a commission. So what do these first followers of Jesus do? Well, Luke, Luke tells us, verse 12, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. They all joined together constantly in, what's the word? Prayer. I think, I think a lot of us genuinely want to see a move of God in our lives, in our marriages in our jobs, and our finances, the question is, are, are we willing to actually pray about it? Like, I, to me, I'm such a, a doer, it's hard, for, it's hard for me to ever be still. Jesus says, I mean, you've been doing a lot in your own strength. Maybe you need to go first receive from me. Prayer is one of those things, it's, to me, it's kind of like, it's kind of like flossing sometimes. St- stick with me. <laughs> it's like, it's, the, it's a thing that we probably know we should do and is good for us. But sometimes we, we kind of put off, you know? Like, to me, like, going to the dentist now feels like going to confession a little bit, you know? Like, forgive me, Father, it's been exactly six months since I've lost last, you know? You know what I mean? You all have that experience, you all better, like, they do that thing where their hands are in your mouth, and they're like, sure, have you been flossing? And you're like, we don't need to do this, you know that I haven't. Like, you're, <laughs> you're seeing what I see, we don't have to, Right? There's nothing I could say that's like, oh, we, we should be a people of prayer. Most of us are like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. Most of us know that we should, and yet maybe we struggle. And I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. Maybe we don't know how. We feel like God requires some f- fancy words from us, and we forget that prayer is an invitation. Maybe we're just, we convinced ourselves we're too busy for it. Maybe, like in our heart of hearts, we doubt it works. So why bother? Maybe we don't because we didn't. That's been so long that we feel more shame the longer we don't. Maybe we don't know where to begin. And I love the way that Paul puts it to the church in Rome. He says, when we don't know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through groanless words, or wordless groans. That means like even when, you don't, even when all you have is ugh, bring it. Ugh can be a prayer. Tears can be prayers. Do you know that help is a complete prayer? In fact, that might be the best one. Lord, help. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to navigate this. Lord, help. Whatever it is, whatever the reason, what if we became a people committed to not simply trying to do good things in our own strength, but to first say, Lord, help. Because what my friends and family members don't need is more like clever ideas from Ian. Or like my best laid plans or strategy that I worked really, as good as all that can be, what they actually need is the power of presence of God in their life. And I can't give to people 
if I'm not actually first being filled up, being poured into by the Holy Spirit of God. There are a lot of reasons that we should pray. I think the best to become a person who consistently prays is because we follow someone who made it a priority. Jesus is regularly doing this. The Gospels tell us that like, while there were still sick people, there were still villagers being like, can you please stay 10 more minutes, one more day. He's regularly retreating. To be in intimacy with the Father. Why would we think that we're any different? Over and over and over again, Jesus is prioritizing prayer. I love the way that Hudson Taylor, who was a, uh, a British missionary to China, said it. He says, do not have your concert first and then tune your instrument afterwards. Begin the day with the word of God and prayer and get first of all into harmony with him. If, if we are serious about bringing the gospel to every table, we need to have our hearts tuned to his. We need to be able to discern the voice of the shepherd above all other voices. It's not just like a, a good deed that I should do. It's, Lord, help me to see with your eyes, to hear with your ears. So let me just, let me just kind of give a, a brief kind of outline for, for maybe making prayer a priority in these coming weeks, particularly as we're talking about bringing the gospel to every table. The first is to simply plan. Things that are important on our calendar. I don't mean that it sounds so blunt, but... At least in my life, I'm like, I live and die by my, by my calendar. Important things are on our calendar. Maybe, it, maybe it's right now saying, all right, five minutes before this or five minutes after that or whatever. Like, put it on the calendar. Second is to prepare. One of the things, this is a little silly, but like, I've been praying, Lord, prepare my heart for the adventure of following you. And that's been really stretching for me because I, historically, I have not always thought about following Jesus as an adventure. If I'm really blunt, a lot of my life has, has felt more like a duty. Like, Lord, man, fa- man, the kingdom of God from heaven to earth, that's a wild adventure. Prepare my heart for adventure. And then third, I would say this. Ask God to show you people and places that he's calling you to. God, give me names and faith. Like, actually, show, m- map your day. Like, the places that you know that you're going to go and the people that you'll visit. Who are the people that you'll encounter? Because ultimately, why pray? Here's why. Because God can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. I fully believe that. God can do more in a moment than I can with an entire lifetime of striving or ingenuity or strategy or vision state or any of that. God can do more in a moment. One word from God is worth more than a thousand words from anyone else. And yet so often I run to those thousand other words, those thousand other voices before God. If we want to fully experience our part of what Jesus said in Acts 1-8, to the ends of the earth, it is never going to be about us doing it in our own strength. If, if we think that charge still applies to us today, if we want to see our families and our cities and our neighborhoods and our jobs and our schools transformed, it is not in us getting more clever, us having better strategies. It's, again, as good as all those things are, it's us collectively as a family saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Speak to me, pour into me, help, help me to live and operate out of your power, not my own. And I'd argue that for the last 2,000 years, the most impactful church has always been the one gathered around a table, following the words, works, and ways of Jesus. The, go- the, the table is where the gospel is embodied. Yeah. Where it goes from like theoretical to practical, like, can I tell you about the good news of the kingdom of God in my life? Do you know anyone in your life that could desperately use some hope? some healing, to be seen, to have someone simply be present with them. In fact, I would argue that every table is a bridge. I mean, there's a reason that that's what this church is called, about building bridges to those who are far from God, those who are hurting. What if we saw tables not just as places to eat or commune, but to build a bridge to other people's hearts? to build a bridge to their lives? What, what, if we, what if we couldn't get that idea out of our brains? What if we couldn't sit at a table without thinking, Lord, at this table as it is in heaven? Bring your kingdom here to this moment. Jesus' main change-making tool was the table. What if we actually took that seriously? What if we actually prayed at this table as it is in heaven? So two, two quick challenges, and they should be really simple. The first is to simply pray. And I won't prescribe how to do that, What if we just made that a priority? What if it was prayer walking? What if we prayer walked our neighborhoods and just prayed for the homes in our neighborhood, even if we don't know their names? What if we showed up to work 10 minutes earlier and just prayer walked our building? 
prayer walked our school. Lord, would you move in me and through me today in this place? And then secondly, I'd love for you to, I'd love for you to join me and set, set your phone alarm to 505. That's May 5th. That's Commitment Sunday. To pray every day leading up to May 5th and ask, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you have me participate in what it is that God is doing at the bridge? You can set it to a.m. or p.m., depending on how ambitious you are. But I would love for that to be a reminder for us, not just to pray, but the reminder that our whole church is also praying. That is, this isn't just an individual endeavor, but a communal one. Lord, help us walk in lockstep with your spirit, with what you're doing. I'll close with this. I love the way that Richard Foster put it. He said, if we truly love people, we will desire for them far more than it is within our power to give them. And that will lead us to prayer. The older I get, the more God like breaks my heart for what breaks his, the more I look at the people in my life and I'm like, what I ultimately desire for people is way more than what I can give them myself. That they don't need one more sermon or idea or philosophy. They need the power and presence of God in their life. The more that God helps us to see others the way that he sees them, it will, it will burn in us. Man, I desire for you something that I can't give you myself. Therefore, that's leading me to prayer. To pray for every domain, every table, every relationship, every home, every cubicle, every cafeteria, every conference table. Lord, at this table as it is to heaven, may it be said of us, that we were people not operating out of our own power or strength or ingenuity, but by the power and presence of God in our life. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of your spirit. Forgive me for the times that I have genuinely forgotten the weight and gravity of the mission that you've given us. God, forgive us for ever giving lip service or going through the motions. And yet, God, thank you again for the gift of grace for all the times that we fall way short. Help us to see with your eyes, God. Break our hearts for what breaks yours and help us to be your hands and feet wherever you have us. Help us to live as sent people, God. To the glory of God and for the sake of the world. We love you. And we pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. We're going to celebrate uh, communion together now, the table of Jesus. And I, I like saying it that way because it's, at least for me, it's a reminder that the table is not mine. It's not the bridges. It's the table of Jesus. And the table of Jesus is not for the worthy, it's for the hungry. That when we could do nothing to earn, deserve, or merit God's favor, man, he comes after us and he... He shares a meal just hours before his arrest and crucifixion. He says, this bread is my body, which is given for you. This, this cup is my blood poured out for you, not just so that when you gather, you're filled with gratitude for what he's done, but also a way of saying, man, I'm participating in this resurrected life. It's not just simply saying thank you. It's also saying, let's go. Let's go. Thank you, God, for loving a wretched sinner like me and not leaving us there, but the miracle of him actually inviting us to live on mission with him. What a gift. So when the trays are passed, I'd encourage you to take both the cups. They're stacked on each other. Hold on to the bread and the cup, and we're going to sing and celebrate together, and then we'll receive together in just a couple minutes. Let's all stand together now as we sing. Evidence. 
fences all around that the spirit of the Lord is here overflow in this place fill our hearts with your love your love surrounds us you're the reason we came to he gathered with his disciples at the table and he took the bread and he said this represents my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me so let's receive the bread together and in the same way the cup it represents his blood that was shed for us for every single one of us so let us receive the cup now together in remembrance of him to worship together. Let's just sing the words of this bridge, asking God for his spirit to come and fall on us. That he is here and we need his presence. <laughs> 